Hello and welcome again to another episode of One Starfish, where our mission is to change the world one starfish or one person at a time. As always, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, share all the things. I'm excited for our guest today. I know there's going to be a lot of gold. Uh, John and I met in an RTA event and got to know each other. Um, he runs a real estate brokerage, the largest independent real estate brokerage in Michigan. Um, started it in 2018 when he got fired from Remax, which sounds like an intriguing story. Has about 100 team members that he's working with right now. And they're doing some big things um, there. And he's got an amazing personal story, too. So thanks so much for being on the podcast, John. Well, I appreciate it. When you reached out, it was like yeah, instantly, right? So uh, I appreciate you. I really uh, honestly like... I feel like there's certain people that you meet in life. There's a, there's a reason why. Right. And when I met you at Arte, I was just very, uh, I mean, you had a big impact on me, you know, and so not something we've even talked about, but so I'm super excited to be on and, and to share. Cool. I'm excited. Well, let's go back. Like we talked a little bit before and I know you have an impactful story. Um, so let's go back to like, well, let's, let's go back to just 2018 and then we're going to go back probably yeah. farther. Okay. Than that. But let's go back. Like, how did you, what did you get in real estate? And how do you get fired from real estate? Like <laughs> What the heck? So, um, long story short, I've been, I've been in real estate probably since, I, I don't, like time to me doesn't even matter, right? A long time, 12 <laughs> years, 15 years, I don't even have a clue. Uh, if my manager were here, he could answer that for us, but I don't know the answer um, because it's irrelative really. But um, in 2018, I remember that date because we were fired by Remax and essentially like Remax didn't fire us. The manager of that particular office along with the owner made a decision to fire us. And, you know, at that time, um, we were the, we were the biggest, uh, Remax, um, I guess you would not, I would say team inside of Michigan. And we started to explore our own title company, right? The owner of that Remax had their own title company, which obviously is a revenue producer. And I kept getting approached about, uh, doing a joint venture with a local title company. And I kept saying no, and I kept saying no, and I kept saying no. And as we grew, every time I said no, it was leaving more money on the table. But more importantly, the service was starting to, to fail, right? The service that we were receiving just wasn't great. And so one day I brought everybody in. Well, we have a team meeting every Tuesday and I had everybody in there and I said, if you had one deal that you had to close, it was the most important deal of your life and you could choose whatever title company you wanted, who would it be? And they, like, I still have all these little notes, by the way, they all wrote on a piece of paper, the title company. And I put them in this trophy that I have. Um, it's still in my office right now with the paper in it. And I pulled them out and read them one at a time. And one person had selected the title company we were currently using. And almost everybody else selected the co title company that had been approaching me. Well, they didn't know this. And I was like, wow, that was pretty profound, right? So just making a wise business decision, I didn't start the company, but I started to move some title work to them. And by the way, for the people that are like, what the hell is title? What is he talking That's about? That's me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right. Every, your car has a title to it and a home has a title to it. And a title company, their job is to, uh, they're essentially insuring the title. So there's making, they're making sure there's no encumbrances on the title. Uh, there's no liens. Uh, there's, you know, no work that's been done that's not been paid for. There's no easements that you don't know about, et cetera, et cetera. So they're insuring the property. And um, it was just one of those things where, you know, it's an important part of the transaction. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of back and forth with the agent and with our staff. So it is, you know, the better they do, the more easier our lives are, I guess is a good way to put it. So we just started moving some title there. We didn't start anything. We just started moving some title there because we wanted to make sure that they were going to be able to perform. And as soon as we moved a couple of deals, because, you know, uh, that title company knew pending goes in the board, but it does, the title doesn't go to them. On a Friday, the guy called me in and was bitching me out. And I was like, hey, whoa, whoa, you know, it's all good. And on Monday, he let me go. He called me in his office, said, you know, we've had some good times and some bad times. And I'm like, I don't think we've ever had sex. What are you talking about? Like, what do you want to do right now? He's like, we're letting you go. I'm like, all right, we'll get the fuck out of my way because they gave me three days to get out. And, uh, you know, we have a team of like 30. So that's a big move in three days, not knowing where we're going to go. And really at that time, like, I'll never forget this moment because that's a big, that's a big to do. Right. And I think this is a big leadership piece too. Right. Like instead of going out and telling everybody, I went home, I walked in the house, found my wife. She was getting, she was in the, uh, not in the shower. <laughs> she just got out of the shower. She's like blow drying her hair. She's like, what are you doing here? And I said, I got to talk to you for a minute. She's like, okay, what? I was like, no, I need your attention. Put the blow dryer down. <laughs> and I told her, I said, I just got fired. And she, my wife is very ABC one, two, three, right? I'm fly by the seat of my pants, make shit happen. She was a school teacher when we met. So uh, security is important to her. 
And I knew that. And so I went home and I told her and she said, are we going to be okay? I'm like, fucking right. We are. Don't worry about it. But I need you to come to the office with me because I need to tell the team. So while I had gone home, I had um, one of my managers round everybody up, put them in a room. And I just came back and said, listen, we've got a great opportunity ahead of us. You know, uh, we're going to go in a different direction. Remax has decided to let us go. We're going to, we need to make a choice whether we're going to go independent or if we're going to find another brokerage to join. And everybody was like, right away, they wanted to go independent, you know, and we had basically built our own business inside of this brand. So we were just basically moving the bodies to a different location, Perfect. a bunch of other stuff behind the scenes that I didn't realize you had to do, <laughs> but you know, there was more to it than that. But, um, by the grace of God, we ended up in this building and, um, uh, it's emotional, man, 12,000 square feet. And at that time we occupied, like, I'm like, what the hell do we need this thing for? But it was the only building big enough to house us, house us, but it was way too big for what we needed. Um, and it did have a couple of tenants, so that helped. And now we occupy almost the whole building, which is pretty cool. So that's the long and short of, of that. And I'm proud to say that. You know, like that, when I say we got fired by Remax, everybody's like, oh, what'd you do wrong? Nothing. <laughs> you know? So. That's awesome. So you went in and started your own, um, your own brokerage, and now you have about 100 team members. And. You're the largest independent brokerage in Michigan. So that's yeah. going well, which is super awesome. Let's go back farther. Um, you said you had an interesting childhood, upbringing, you know, adulthood. Let's talk about some of that and what made you, I guess, get to where you are today. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. You know, certain people will bring this out of me. Certain people will not. I feel like you're kind of the one that does. But, you know, um, it's, it's one of those stories that... It, I'm not looking for a dramatic effect, but there's really no other way to, to share it than to, that it, because it's a dramatic event, a traumatic event, right? Um, I was abused as a child. Um, my, uh, my, I grew up on a freaking single wide trailer and, and there was a lot of drugs and alcohol in our household. And my mom was the abuser, you know, and I know a lot of times it's the dad, but it was my mom. Um, and, and I don't want to go too deep on this. I will just say I was abused every way you can think of, including sexually abused by her. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm again, making a long story short, but, and this is what I share when I, when I speak, you know, I, I speak at real estate conferences and I don't really talk about real estate because to me, that shit is easy. I mean, if you've got good intent behind you and you've got a good work ethic, selling homes is not difficult. And so I like to share about personal struggles and overcoming, you know, and alcohol is another thing that, you know, I'm in the midst of overcoming. And actually when it, when, when I got into this fight with alcohol and really recognized I wanted to beat it, I looked back at this moment in my life and I'm like, dude, you've overcome fucking everything. And now this thing is what's going to be standing in the way. And I just made a decision to be done. But, you know, that, that abuse went on for a while. And, um, and then one morning I was looking for my mom. I couldn't find her. And I went all over the house trying to find her and couldn't find her. My dad was at work and I'm six at the time. And uh, I go down in the basement and she was hanging there. You know, she had hung herself. And so, um, you know, those moments are, are just those things that are etched in your mind, you know, and, and you uh, no matter what you do to block them, they stay with you. And I did a good job blocking it. I started drinking when I was 10. <laughs> you know, um, I never um, I never really dealt with it. And. And even until now, I've really never got a lot of counseling over it. I've just dealt with it. And I look back at all of those things. And, you know, after that, my dad, God bless his heart, you know, he's he's still alive right now. Um, but he went dark, man. He became a hardcore alcoholic. He became abusive himself. Um, and so I just lived this childhood of, I guess you would say, seeking love, you know, like I, I wasn't getting it at home and I was getting the opposite. And, you know, I, I, my dad is redeemed by the grace of God. And I'll share that story. And I share that up front because, I, you know, when I say these things about him, I'm not trying to belittle him. I actually feel worse for him than I feel for myself. I don't pity myself at all, by the way. But I'm just like, I think about the phone call that my dad got at work, right? Like, yes, I was there and I saw it, but I'm six. I don't even know what the hell it means other than she's dead. You know, he's at work and getting this phone call. And that's what you know, really crushes me like that breaks my heart, but he just, you know, he became a hardcore alcoholic and, and, uh, you know, and along with that became very abusive, became very belittling, um, taunted me every day of my life, told me I'd never amount to shit, um, you know, on and on and on and on. And, and I look back at all that stuff and I'm like, thank you, God, you know, thank you for making me go through that stuff to be who I am today. 
And as odd as that may sound, that's how I really feel. Everything that's happened in my life leading up to this second, right? Including running around like a chicken trying to get ready for the Zoom because I, I had, the computer wasn't working. Like all of those things have, pre have prepared me for what I'm going to do today. And uh, I just want to have a big impact on people. And I think that's what drives me to build this business. It's not about the money. Yeah, obviously, you know, we do well. Um, but that 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 piece of it, I know so many times people, especially in the entrepreneur space, they're running around seeking money and fame or material things. And all those things are great. But none of them are going to bring you real joy. None of them are going to fulfill you in a life. And I find just a lot of fulfillment in the people around me. You know, I get to, I mean, like I said, we've got almost 100 people here. And by the way, we've got three offices. We own, a, we have a title company, obviously. <laughs> um, so there's seven or eight employees in there. Um, we have a mortgage company as well. There's four employees in there. So it's not just there's 100 people inside of Wentworth Real Estate. There's 100 people inside of all of our, um, you know, other businesses. But, you know, it's... Um, it's, it's one of those things. It's like you, no matter what you've gone through, and this is why, I, you know, people that make excuses, you know, don't ever go anywhere because until we own our shit and until we were, are willing to face it, we just can't get through it. And, and we've got to be able to find our passion in something other than material things. And for me, it's people. I love people. You know, like I said, we've got however many people are here today. I go around, I hug every single one of them every single morning. You know, that's how I start my day. That's what I love about coming here. So, no, this is good. So I want to go back. So you went through, um, obviously, a very traumatic childhood. Um, and, you know, some people come out of that and they get worse. And some people come out of it, obviously, like you and used it as a catalyst to get better. Um, was there a shift at any point? Like you started drinking at 10. Your dad was super abusive. You know, was there a shift? Like, where did you go from? Like, if you remember where you went from, like, I'm not going like, yes, we'll talk about alcoholism. And I know you've been, you know, you're still working on that, which I'm super proud of you for that. Um, Cause it's hard, but okay. like, was there a shift that you're like, okay, I'm going to do something with my life. Yeah. And, or like, I could have, you could have gone worse. Like you could have gone into the total drug scene and down yeah. the, like living on the street scene. Do you remember any like catalyst 100%. moments by chance? Yeah, hundred percent clear as day. And listen, I'm 51, I think, 51 or 52. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Before I was 50, I didn't know how old I was. And after 50, <laughs> I don't know how old I was. <laughs> but 50, I remember. Um, <laughs> my wife took me to Italy. <laughs> but um, yeah, there was definitely a moment. And, and you know, leading up to this moment, I was in and out of drinking, right? Like there was plenty of times I, I knew I needed to get my shit together. And I would go into those moments where I would get sober for a little while and then fall off. And my drinking wasn't like... You know, it's funny because, you know, people would say to me, you're, you're an alcoholic. People wouldn't, didn't know, or I guess, how do you really define it? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to her? What does it mean to somebody else? Right. For me, it wasn't like, I, I mean, I was still functional. I was still going to work. I was still doing those things. Um, I also trained and drove racehorses. So that was my passion. You know, I talked about that when I got out of high school and sports was the big thing that really kept me going. You know, my dream was to play professional hockey. Uh, my dream was to be on the Olympic team, right? Again, I'm 51, I think. And, you know, the 1980 USA Olympic hockey team. And that was my dream, right? And and even that dream, my dad crushed. You know, I, I would say, I'm going to be an All-American. And he said, you already are. You're an All-American fucko. You know, it was just this nonstop belittling. And so my adult life, right, I get into training horses. Um, I, I, I learned so much in that. Met so many great people, um, people on every ends of the spectrum. And, and even in that, I would go through spurts of drinking really hard, and then I would get sober. And when I would get sober, really good things would happen. And then when the good things happen, you start celebrating those good things a little bit too much, right? And then it, it just became this fucking roller coaster. And frankly, I got to a point in, in most recently where I was just tired. I just, it was time to surrender, you know? And so, but that one point that you're talking about, um, I was, I had just played in a hockey tournament up North for us. That's like in Michigan, you go up North. It's the same thing as here. You it's almost go. like Canada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And, um, and I played in a hockey tournament and I was a fool that weekend. I, I was drank way too much. I woke up without shoes. Um, I went to the rink drunk. I played goalie by the way. So like, it's not really easy to hide being drunk. Um, <laughs> and I came home and it, I, I'm sure anyone that's drinks been hungover, Right. 
and you're in that moment of vulnerability and you're also in that moment of like, shit, why am I doing this? I'm never doing this again. You know, all the shit we've all told each other ourselves before. And this moment though, the girl that I was dating at the time was at my house and it was a very, um, she drank a lot too. And so it was this very combative relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, I always liked watching these ESPN stories, right? Again, sports brought me back. I don't even watch sports now, which is so funny. Uh, but this morning I'm watching ESPN and the story comes on by Tom, Tom Rinaldi about, and you can go find this episode on YouTube right now. And by the way, if you're struggling with anything, go find this episode right now. Um, this guy comes on, his name is Todd Crandall, and he starts talking about his life. I mean, this is like an 11 minute thing on, on ESPN, right? A big deal. And he was a goalie in hockey. I'm like, well, that's me. His mother committed suicide. I'm like, that's me. Like all these parallels. And I, so I'm bawling, right? Watching this. And the girl that I was dating is like, you don't cry for this, but you won't cry for us. I remember this specifically. <laughs> and, uh, and at that moment, I just was like, I'm done with her. And it wasn't because of her. It was because I knew I needed to be for me, probably for her too. Right. <laughs> so. um, and I literally emailed this dude. I, and at that time, like, I don't even, I didn't even know really how to email. Like I had to get one of my buddies to help me do this. I had just, I was just going to get into real estate. I was still playing hockey, but I was all fucked up. I emailed this guy and I'm driving in to the office and I get a phone call and it's a 419 area code. And I know that area code is Ohio because when I raise horses in Ohio, like I know all these area codes, like I know most of the area codes in Canada, by the way. <laughs> um, I answered the phone and he said, is this John? And I said, yeah, he goes, it's, this is Todd Crandall. I'm like, this motherfucker just was on ESPN calling me. Wow. And the next day I drove to Ohio and I got sober. And this was the first time I got sober for a while. Um, and that was a, that was a, he ended up being one of the, I had two best men in my wedding and he was one of them. And so I got sober. I, I, I started playing hockey like for serious. Um, I joined like five men's leagues. So every night I just wanted to be occupied. I want to, you know, I, idle mind is a devil's workshop. Right. And so I just wanted my time occupied, especially in the evening. So I'm on all these different men's leagues playing hockey. And then I actually went, we have a local hockey team that was a, a semi pro team all my childhood growing up. Right. So it was a dream to play for the Flint generals. Well, I actually went through training camp, tried out, um, played in a preseason game in my home rake, like, you know, just this dream come true moment. And, you know, usually like when it's like the clock is counting down three, two, one, you want it to end. And I'm like, no, don't ever end. <laughs> um, we, we won the game. It was just really cool. And then I delivered a speech to all these young 19, 20, 21 year old kids about drinking because, you know, listen, at that age and especially in hockey, like that's what we did and that's what they do, you know. And so uh, that was just a really cool moment and a little bit of redemption for me. You know, to be able to play at that level at like, I was freaking 35 years old and I hadn't played in 15 years. Like I was totally done once I got out of high school. That's something about me. Like, I mean, they're all in or all out, which has been good in, in some ways and bad in others. <laughs> right now with drinking, it's working good. Um, but that moment reaching out to Todd and just, um, I, I drove down there the next day. I went to one of his meetings. You know, we, everybody went around the table. I'm, I do cocaine. I snort, uh, I snort cocaine. I do math. I'm like, holy fuck. These guys are like, they're doing serious drugs. And it came to me and I'm like, man, I don't remember exactly what I said, but something to affect, like, I'm really proud of you guys. By the way, I'm like 35 at that time. I've got about three cents to my name. And, uh, I said, I, I've never done any of those drugs. I just drink. And this guy stood up and goes, alcohol is a drug too. Like he was pissed at me. And, uh, and it was just, you know, Todd now has grown that foundation huge. It's called Racing for Recovery. Um, actually, I spoke in Nashville. This was really wild. This is how God works, right? I spoke in Nashville. This was like three years ago at a real estate conference to the elite of every everybody in, in, in real estate, right? Like the top, the top 100 of the top one team in every state basically would be a good way to put it. And all I talked about was, you know, life. A guy in the crowd goes, I know Todd Crandall. I'm like, you do? He goes, yeah, I'm from Sylvania, Ohio. That's where he's from. So pretty wild, you know, and and it's just, that was the journey. That's what started it. And, and through that, at the only time that it could ever possibly happen because I was sober is when I met my wife, right? And that is the, when God delivered her to me is what I really say, you know, he delivered her to me on my doorstep. Uh, I met her on match.com. She didn't even have a photo. 
Like I, I, I didn't know how I was going to meet. Like I'm sober. I'm doing well. I want to have companionship. Going to the bar at 2 a.m. isn't going to cut it anymore. And so how am I going to meet somebody? So I went on Match.com. Now you got to remember again, this is freaking 17 or 18 years ago. And I was on there and I'm like, this is the dumbest shit ever. <laughs> and then somebody <laughs> new pops up and it's Jennifer Rowe, no photo. And I, so I message her. I'm like, yeah, welcome to this shit show or something like that. Right. And I don't know, a few weeks later, we ended up going on a date. Six months later, we were engaged. Six months later, we were married. And uh, the rest is history. 17 years. So she truly is. Uh, she saved my life. I mean, truly. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, this Todd Crandall, I just got emotional while you were telling the story because, you know, it's that, it's that one starfish. You know, he reached out and he called you. And because of that one call and, and you know, sometimes we don't feel like doing that stuff. We don't feel like making the call. We don't feel like doing the thing because it's like, ah, oh, I just don't want to. But you never know when that one call or that one thing could completely change someone's life like yours, John. And like, true that, be able to help so many other people um, with their lives. Like, wow, that's yeah. that's amazing. Um, yeah, he's so we'll have the information for Todd and his stuff in the show notes. Yeah, he's done tremendous stuff. He's still very active. He's grown this facility huge and impacting a lot of lives. And, and like I said, he was he was one of the best men in my wedding. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> he became a good buddy. But you know, when I went back to drinking, I kind of went in hiding from him because I was ashamed. And and that's the thing, like, you know, you go through these journeys. And and oddly enough, my wife and I were just in Aruba with our kids. And Aruba's when I uh, I don't know, 15 years ago when I started drinking again. I was there with her and we were at dinner. And we're actually sitting at the pool and we're having just having this conversation. She's like, so you just can't like drink one beer. Right. And I'm like, no, I'm a fucking alcoholic. <laughs> right. Like, don't you get it? But I did about an hour later, I ordered a Corona and I had a beer and that night we went to dinner and I had a glass of wine. It was the first time I had wine. And you know, this is, this is that slow unraveling, right? It, it, like one decision the impact of that decision is immediate, but it's not profound. It becomes prof profound through time, right? And that slow unraveling, and then next thing you know, I'm you know I'm in this 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 place of you know, I mean honestly, when we met, which was six months ago now, um, I would say not that my marriage was ever in danger, but it wasn't fucking good, and my parenting wasn't good. Um, and again, it wasn't like I was this full blown, crazy alcoholic. I, but I, I, when I drank, I drank a lot, you know, and when I didn't drink, I didn't drink obviously, but I don't know. It's just, uh, it's very interesting to sit here and think about this, especially with you, because you and I had these conversations, you know, and you know, this is why life is so life trumps anything you're ever going to do in business and anything you want to do in business is going to be escalated by the goodness you do inside of your life and the, and what you do for others. You know, this is a big thing. I don't know if you noticed, I did some posts on this recently. Um, and I'm starting to get really passionate about this drinking thing. <laughs> um, and you've been part of that. You inspired me part of it. Just listen to you now, like, you know, drinking is such a, Oh man, like, I quit drinking because of my health. Um, and now I've just decided, I mean, it's been five years and I'll, uh, you know, I'll just never drink again. I've decided that even when I'm healed, but um, cause there's no point, but I just, you know, it's so interesting how people push for it and it just drives me nuts. And also just listen to you, like how we think it is better than meth or cocaine, but it's not, yeah. if it's an addiction, it's an addiction. Yeah. Even like, you know, the most, the most healthy addiction out there is food, which is also the most unhealthy addiction because you have yeah. to eat to live, but it can also kill you. So yeah. like, you know, this stuff makes me, I could just feel I'm super passionate because like, we shouldn't be making people drink. We shouldn't be like, uh, why do we do that? Why do we like, oh, you can have just one. No, it's like one line of Coke. No, you can't. So well, like, and it's, it's just conditioned into our society. I mean, every everything is alcohol. You know, every every team. Yeah, that's our. That, that not like, oh man, I could go on. This is going to be forever. Like yeah, I just think not. of like outwitting the devil with Napoleon Hill. Is this not one of those things that like brought in to try to slow us down, try to make us dumber, so the government can like run <laughs> us? Like I don't yeah. know. I'm just like. <laughs> no, now. I get it. I mean. <laughs> You know, and it's one of those things too, like when you, you, you become passionate about something because you lived it and then you see the other side, it's like, it's like knowing Jesus, right? For me, like I never had a relationship with God ever in my life. And then when I was, you know, 
this was probably like I'm 40 and I go to this men's retreat because I thought it'd be good for business because all these people kept asking me to go. And I thought I was doing good at that time. Right. And I go to this men's retreat. I tr cried for 48 hours and I came out of there just a different person. Like now I really get what it's all about, you know, and, and that foundation with Jesus has the thing that's endured me through all of this stuff. And when I look back now at the time, I didn't know God brought Jesus or Jennifer to me. I just thought I was so handsome that she could, I couldn't I, say no. <laughs> I don't think that by the way. I'm just talking shit. But you know, it just you you when when I sit back and and this was the thing with with not drinking this time is like I'm just tired of the fucking fight. I'm tired of the and by nature I like to fight for stuff. You know what I mean? So it's like there, but let's fight. Let's put the energy into something that's better. Like yeah, yeah, I just yeah, I'm super proud of you. And like I said, I just think this is a big thing. Um, so guys, if you're listening to this, like share this, you know, I have friends that are right now struggling with this and, yeah. you know, I just, I'm just like, so, so in saying that, how can someone, if someone in your life is going through something like this, what are some ways that you can help support them? Um, cause I mean, they have to make the decision in the long run, obviously it's a hundred percent their decision, but what are some ways that someone can support someone, whether it's a spouse or whether it's just a friend or whatever it is to help them come through some of whatever addiction it is, um, whether they want to admit it's addiction or not, whatever yeah. it is that they need to get out of. <laughs> you know, I think it's obviously it's different for everybody. And I've had a lot of people ask me that question lately. And I actually, um, I, I spoke at uh, a local um, event here, probably I was like three weeks into my sobriety right after coming home from Arate. And I was asked to speak at this um, of a guy that I know runs this thing called Involved Dad. So it's all about fatherhood and it's all in the African-American community. Right. Um, and and so I go to this thing and I speak and and I ended up sharing about my drinking and I was apprehensive to do so because I didn't trust myself. And here's another piece like I think a lot that's a lot of the reason we 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 don't commit to something is because we're afraid of that we're going to fail. And, and by doing that, we're going to let other people down, right? So a good a friend of mine and mentor of mine, John Sheplak, um, you know, I, I, I coach with him. Uh, I have for seven years, but he's become a good friend of mine. He's been sober about 11 years. And, and I went into hiding even on him, even on face to face, because I didn't want him to know how much I was struggling because I didn't want to try to get sober and then let him down. And so these are like the first calls you make once you get sober, right? But I share this at this thing and this guy comes up to me afterwards, right? Great big black dude. And I'm like, hey, what's up, man? He's like, <laughs> and he's almost crying, right? He's like, I'm about to lose everything. And I gave him my phone number. We stayed in touch every every day, not every day, but very often since then. And he's been sober. Now he went through it. So this is the answer, right? Like people have to first recognize it. And then once they first recognize it, they usually don't fix it right away. There's this battle that starts to ensue. Right. And they don't. It's drink not that anything. bad. Like even listen to you, like it's not, yeah. this is what I'm hearing of my friends. It's not that bad. Yeah. I can, I can keep going. I'm a, I would call it a functioning alcoholic. Um, but they don't even call themselves that, but like, it's not, I'm like, I'm getting yeah, up in the, the morning. I'm still going to work. It's not stopping me. Da, da, those da, are da. the people that aren't ready yet. Yeah. So Darius was ready because he said, I'm about to lose it all. And I got to <laughs> fix this. Now, that doesn't mean he was going to quit drinking that day. And I think that's what people can do well is support people through that journey and understanding that just because they say they want it and just because you want it for them doesn't mean they're going to fix it now. But it does mean they do want to fix it. And so just stick by their side. Like I just made a post yesterday. I was down in the gym. We have a gym at our office. And usually there's five or six people down there. We have an instructor. It was just me and Christian, my son. Uh, instructor was out sick, da, da, da. And I like to play worship music when I work out. Like I like to call myself. I don't need to get hyped up. I'm fucking hyper enough, <laughs> you know? And so we're working out and I'm just crying. And I'm thinking to myself, man, our God is so good. Like he saved me. And I made this post, right? Like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for never giving up on me. Well, those are the same things that you can do for that person, right? But but it takes sometimes a big event. My big event was the stuff that happened at Arate, like all of these things lining up where God is just telling me it's time. It's you can stop now. You can surrender. You can let go, you know, and, and Ed had played a big part of that. And I went to Arate, no shit, to talk to Ed about my drinking. That's fucking why I went there. I'm not even kidding. I spent 15 grand to go talk to Ed about my drinking. Why Ed? Um, because when I heard his story about his dad, I didn't want to be that dad to my son, to my daughter or to my wife. 
And so literally when we were there, I went up to him and I said, Hey, I just want to talk to you real quick. You know, and I went into the scene and he's like, well, how bad is it? I said, bad enough. I'm fucking telling you, <laughs> you know, and uh, we talked for a moment. And then he was just getting ready to go on stage. And that was just prior to when I ended up asking him that question about my workout, because I would work out. And I think this, this is really what I didn't, this isn't what cured me, but this certainly helped, right? Like what cured me were the choices that I made, but this was a catalyst. Um, you know, I would be in the gym working out, thinking about not drinking every day. And inevitably I would end up drinking. And so when he was talking about that, that playing that game film in your mind, it really resonated with me. Like, no, that, what I'm doing is the opposite of what I need to be doing. So I started playing this game film in my head and I still do it today. I did it this morning, right? The three greatest things that have ever happened in my life. And then the three things, the outcomes that I'm, that I want this year. And, and that helped a lot. Um, and I, like I said, I still do it to this day. You know, the three things were getting married, having kids, um, oddly enough, one of them was we, we own thoroughbred racehorses and this chocolate ride is a horse that we only won this great big race. My whole family was there. Um, we were photographed by the newspaper. So I had this amazing photo of my wife screaming, she's holding our kid, I'm crying. Um, and so that's one of my memories, you know, and then I roll it into the next three things. And the next three things were be sober on one year, be sober on the one year date, rent an airplane and fly to be on Ed's podcast. That was my three. Now, why Ed's podcast? Will that happen? I don't know. But it's big enough. It's audacious enough that it's going to keep me striving. You know what I mean? And so that, for me, helped a lot. But to answer your question, I think it's just that. Keep loving people. Keep My wife was so good at this, man. Because it, a lot of times when you get to this point where you know you need to quit drinking, but you don't quit drinking, you become very hard on yourself. You start to really beat yourself up yes. and I would wake up and I would just be like, I would, I would, I don't want to say hate myself. Cause I, I wouldn't never go that far, but just so mad at myself. Fucking idiot. You know, I would start actually, wow. Yes. I would start. I just realized this. I would start to talk to me the way my dad did. Oh, wow. Um, and, and she just would always say, don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. You know, and she would give me tremendous grace and, uh, you know, and then you just go tackle the next day. But at the end of the day, the support is wonderful. And I mean, I guess depending on how bad it is, sometimes you got to pull the plug on people too. You know, it depends on who they are in your life. I mean, obviously yeah. you don't want a spouse to do that, but again, it could probably be bad enough that they might need to. Yeah. Um, if but I think abuse, just, if it's really, you know, there's stuff. You, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. So, you know, there's no, there's no one answer for that. But at the end of the day, I think it's really interesting to understand the, the dynamic of it. Like you said, well, I'm functional. They're not ready to quit. I'm ready to quit, but I can't, I'm not able right now. You know, and a guy like yeah. Tadarius, I mean, he would call me drunk and I would talk to him. I don't even know this dude, right? I mean, I just freaking met him at a, at a function. And we, and, and here's the thing that happened with, with Ed. And I want to share this because this is important. Like, and it could be anybody. But at that event, as I said, I went up, I talked to Ed. It was a brief conversation. Then the thing ensued about learning about our mind and how that works. And I think really understanding how your mind works is important. Um, but that night when we went to that dinner there, um, the first one outside where they had the, the bar was set up outside and the mm -hmm. cigar lounge was set up outside. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed a cigar, which I didn't smoke cigars, but I didn't, I wanted to something in my hand because I didn't want to drink, you know, and there's that. And a guy came up to me who was a member of our team. And he goes, man, thanks so much for sharing your story. I'm struggling right now too. And, and you're right. There's so many people struggling with this. And, and, and I don't know if it's, they're ashamed to say it or it's so taboo to say it because it's just what we're supposed to do almost in life. But anyway, I don't, I won't say his name because he's an RT, but he comes up, we start talking, we have a great conversation. And this guy all of a sudden is standing there. And you know, we were all dressed up, men are in suit and ties, women in dresses. And this guy's standing there and he's in a sweatsuit. And I'm like, and I'm an open book, if you can't tell, right? <laughs> so this guy comes up, he goes, how are you guys enjoying the event? I said, oh, it's great. And we start to tell him the conversation we're having about drinking and da 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 And he said, well, have you ever thought about um, going to rehab? And I said, well, honestly, you know, it's, it's funny. This is what, this is, this is crazy shit. So Ed asked me this when we were talking briefly. He said, have you ever thought about checking yourself in? I said, yeah, I have. He said, you know, there's a place in Tennessee. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I have it in my, in my tabs on my phone. But there wasn't time for me to go look. I'm pretty sure I have it in my tabs. He said, it's a great place. I've heard you should check it out. 
fast forward to this guy talking to me. He says, have you ever thought about checking yourself in? Right. And, and I honestly like never had before at this point, I had begun to research places. Like I needed to do something, mm -hmm. which is still, you know, it, it, I don't want to say it's sad to say no. that. because No, first. I think it's awesome. It's sad that I didn't do it sooner. Yes. That I didn't recognize it's getting this bad sooner. But I mean, we all reach our point, right? So Ed no. says to me, have you ever thought about checking yourself in? This guy says to me, well, by the way, I said to him, I said, oh, what's your name? And he tells me his name. and I don't know the name. And he said, well, I'm your speaker for tomorrow. It was Tom Patterson. And I'm like, oh, he, he owns... Um, I have the underwear on right Tommy now. Tommy John's. Tommy John's. I have them on right now. They're expensive as shit, but they're friggin' great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he says, well, I have a friend that works at a place in Tennessee. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And so literally I pull it up. I still have it in here. I'll have it in here my entire life. This is the place. I don't know where to go with this thing. Oh, it looks pretty. Um, it's, it's called Onsite. It's in Tennessee. And I showed it to him and he goes, yeah, that's where my friend works. I right away go find Ed and I go, dude, you're not going to believe this. Your buddy, Tom Patterson, or I go, you know, you know, Tom Patterson he goes, yeah, he's my buddy. He's a speaker tomorrow. I go, you know, we were having this conversation and he just told me his buddy works at that place. You were, we were talking about Tennessee and he fucking backhanded me on my chest. Ed did like thump. He goes, if that's not God telling you, then you're never going to hear a message from God. And that was <laughs> like, that was a moment I was done. Like I was already not drinking that night. But in that moment, yeah. I was done. And, and I really, I said to myself, like, because I debated about doing this still. Like, at that point, I think I was going to go. And I was talking to another buddy of mine the next morning, Damon West, who actually spoke at RTA. Yeah. Uh, the coffee and, bean guy. Yeah. Yeah. We had him here. Um, he came and stayed with us, stayed at our house and spoke to our organization and a couple of other friends of mine. One owns a car dealership, well, like 30 of them. And the other guy's a financial advisor. So we all had this guy come in and speak to all of our employees or like 400 people. It's absolutely awesome. He did an amazing job. But um, I was talking to him and asking him about this. And he goes, don't go if you're not ready to quit because you're just going to go spend time and money. And if, and by the way, this guy's been, in, been an addict, been in yeah. prison, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right? And and I, I hung up the phone. I'm like, you know what? I don't need to. I'm just done. And that was it. You know, and, and honestly, it's weirdly, I don't ever think about drinking. I'm just fucking done. I just don't so drink cool. anymore. So. That is so good. Guys, I know we could go forever. We're going to have to wrap up. I'm watching the time. Uh, respecting John's time and everyone's time. In wrapping up, though, I always have three final questions. And I bet we'll have you back on. Um, and then anything that we didn't touch on. Um, because, yeah, I think this stuff is very powerful and needed. So first and final question is, if someone is looking for their purpose, what's one sentence you would say that could help them find it? Make it about others. You know, cool. If it's all about yourself, you'll get you'll get burnt out on that after a while. It's just not big enough. You know, you can fulfill your dreams, you can fulfill your goals, you can make lots of money, you can buy a big ass house, then what? You know, make it about others and that will get you up every day. That'll keep you going. And I think it keeps you focused in the right place as well. It's about serving others instead of what can you get? It's what you can give, not what can you give to get? What can you give to give? Love it. Number two, what's a favorite quote and why? <laughs> I have a bunch of Johnisms. Like for my 50th birthday, my wife made all these things. So, I mean, <laughs> like. Well, I don't really have any quotes. I have Johnisms. I have if something's jacked up or or pictures leaning, I'll say it's leaning like six holes in a Cadillac. Um, I'll, <laughs> um, pimping holes and slamming Cadillac does. Um, I mean, I have all kinds of crazy shit like that. I don't really have a particular quote. I like to just have fun. I don't. I don't rely on a quote that somebody else created. Um, not because that's a bad thing. It just it's just never how, not how you are. It's just never how I've been. So that's good. Third and final question. What's, what's one word or sentence you want on your gravestone? Giver. <laughs> I love it. So you run into someone in a coffee shop and they're like, man, that was awesome. I really like the Tennessee thing. You're right. Like it's like things happen. Pay attention to what's happening around you. Uh, they run into you. What's something we didn't touch on? I know there's a bunch we didn't touch on, but what's something really important that you just really want to leave our listeners with? I mean, I, I just think, you know, like I started this mastermind, right? And because all through real estate, everybody gets into coaching and I never wanted to get into coaching, right? I, I don't want to help somebody go from selling 10 houses to 20. Like it doesn't, again, 
It doesn't impact me. If it impacts you and you're passionate about that, go, go do it like fucking crazy. Right. For, I think understanding yourself and understanding what is, what you're passionate about and not worrying about what other people think. And by the way, I already forgot the question, <laughs> but the answer uh, for, for me is like, what was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> What's something we didn't touch on that you really want to touch oh, that you think would be impactful? Yeah. So the reason I brought up this mastermind is it, I, I found a way to impact multiple people um, without occupying all of my time. And so the impact of that is not just about business, it's about, it's about personal development as well. And so I would just say, man, for me, like, what are the things we didn't get to? Um, we covered the real important things and that's 10%. And then the other 90%, I mean, parenting, like, gosh, the struggles, the trials that we go through as, 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 you know, family, friends, fathers, marriage, all those things, like I'm an open book to that stuff. And those things are real life, right? And those are the difficult things that we go through. So I just think having this, um, having this alignment and in, in knowing what you want to do and who you serve is very important. And for me, that's Jesus. And if I take care of that and I stay focused on that, everything else takes care of itself. Um, but I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that question because it could be yeah. endless. You know, it could be endless. I, what I would say probably the best question is whatever I, in that moment, I ran into that person in the coffee shop, whatever I could do in that moment to serve them is what we would, we would talk about. I love it. So just go out there guys and serve. And, you know, you're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. Um, and, you know, step into that and figure out what it is and step into that. I love that. Um, guys, let's go out there. Let's share this. I know you'll want to share this. Let's go out there. If we can change one life or one starfish at a time together, we can change the world. Thanks so much for being on, John. Love it. Thank you so much.